This is an interesting one. It's long, it's big, 300% knife. <laughs> Hi, it's Todd from Todd's Workshop and Todd Cutler here. And today I've got a really simple film for you. I've been busy and I'm gonna talk about it. So it's coming up to show season for me where I sell to reenactors and I do my markets and all that kind of thing, as well as filling the website with stuff. And so the Todd's Workshop side of things, well, stuff has happened and here it is. Now the thing is, medieval knives, they are just knives, but they're more than that. They're tools, they're personal possessions, they're items of status, of jewellery, uh, of function. And all of them have a history, a, a, a place of origin, reasons that the materials are used or they're constructed in certain ways, and that means they all have stories. And so really this is, yeah, it's a whole table, 50 odd pieces here that we can talk about. I'm not gonna talk about them all, but there's history here, there's stories, there's technology, there's engineering. So let's just start. No particular order, no date, no rhyme or reason. Let's go for it. So the first up is the biggest one here. Get it out of the way. What a thing. Really, what a thing. So this is based on a piece in Nuremberg Museum. Germans. 15th century Germans particularly. Crazy bunch with their engineering and their, and their metalwork. And this actually sort of screams Germanic the whole way. But actually, if you want to go look them up, even things like if you got your hand chopped off, if you're a knight, you could get a prosthetic hand made, which was posable, and you could have it for different functions. So you could have it for climbing a ladder when you're escalating. You could have it for holding a sword or riding a horse. Mechanical hands. Anyway, enough of that. They also did really cool knives like this. But this is just one of those sort of crazy German things where they just did it because they wanted to do it and could do it. But it's also quite posh, let's face it. Gold-plated fretwork with some nice bright red leather behind it. Bit of fretwork steel on here. Wooden scabbard and an all-steel hilt. This is 100% bling, 100% awesome, 100% functionality, 300% knife. Another German one, actually. Let's go for that. Rondel dagger. About the same period, actually, but again... <laughs> Quite a different piece. So this one is a triangular blade, which I have fallen into the trap before of saying that they're against the Geneva Convention. I think actually it's something to do with the Hague Convention. Come out, educate me again, because I forget these things. But essentially, modern armies are not allowed to be fitted with triangular blades. It's apparently, although probably not, to do with the difficulty of mending the wounds. Who knows? Come and educate me, let's talk about it. Small tight to the fist, tiny skinny handle down to about 12 millimetres, half an inch, but it doesn't feel awkward. A bohemian burnware, so burnware, farmer's knife. Basically it is a utility knife for cutting your bread, I don't know, umbilical cords on sheep, little bit of pruning, something like that. It's got a nargle on it, a little bit of fighting too. This particular style is more bohemian as you would call it, so 15th century sort of Czechoslovakia direction. Slightly different blade form to a standard burnware, and the handle is sort of set more down into the middle almost of the blade. It's kind of, it's an unusual form. It's slightly clunky, slightly ugly, I think, but absolutely period correct, absolutely unique type of piece. Another German one here, and another all steel rondel actually. A customer sent me this and said, please make this, because it is the craziest thing, because it has built into the hilt an awl. So, it, and all in itself is an interesting object. And what were they for? Well, it's kind of a bit like a Swiss army knife in a way of medieval times. You can use it for making holes in tables to put your candlestick in or, or a crack in the wall. You can use it for working on your leather work, unpicking knots, making holes bigger on harness, that sort of thing, prying your buckle pin out because it's got jammed, all sorts of little bits and pieces. And when you're not doing that, you've got yourself a pretty intimidating effectively an armour-piercing dagger. This is one of those really stout blades that's all about fighting, really. Now, when we come to the awl, let's just jump now to some of these eating sets. Now, this one here has got a spoon on the back, a knife, and a pricker. A pricker or an awl. Now, the role of the pricker is a little bit contested because some think that it's used to hold down the food while you cut it with a knife and eat it with a spoon because don't forget forks weren't really invented in the 15th century. Just coming in in Italy, the rest of Europe was behind that. And they were used for cooking but not for eating, which is like kind of slightly curious. And the Romans used to use them for eating but somehow it fell out of use. Anyway, so forks aren't a thing in the 15th century. But they all was. And you see 
the, the pricker, the awl, with an eating knife, not that often, but you see it, and you see it often on sword scabbards as well, but we'll come to that in a bit. But that awl there, is it for eating, or is it just a convenient place to keep your multi-tool next to your knife, which is also obviously useful for eating and for other tasks? It's a bit hard to say. But it does mean that you get sets like that one, which I must confess, actually, and here's another one, a three-piece set, I have never seen in the historical record. However, that doesn't mean they're just not out there. You know, you look at pictures and you'll see people with a, a spoon through their hat and things like that. They, they would have taken their spoon and they would have put it in with the scabbard with the knife and the pricker. It would have happened, you know it. And so I sell those too. But more truthfully, it should really be, truthfully to the record, a knife and a pricker alone. But this seems to be more of a 15th century thing. And then while we're on that subject though, you come to a knife like this. Really interesting little knife here with a bronze hilted handle. This is dated about 1250 through to about 1480, something like that. So it's a really long lived design. And actually uh, it's been found in Ireland, it's been found in England. To me, honestly, it probably looks like it's Dutch or Belgium in origin. So all of that area, this sort of knife would be fine for it. But I decided to marry it up with a little pricker, a little all, and a spoon as a matching set. So that would date that particular item there, particularly to the 15th century. It wouldn't really go earlier because they didn't seem to use the awl in the same way before that. Let's go somewhere different. So while we're talking of eating sets, this is a Bruegel messer, as I call it. Bruegel because you see them in his paintings, often on quite rough blokes. So again, maybe it's a bit of a later development of a farmer's knife in a way, but it has this knuckle bow ring on it. So it's clearly it's about fighting, but it's also looking at the guys that you see it on, it's about work. And I can't remember from Bruegel if you see them with eating sets on them, but this one here has just got an eating knife. That sort of thing, particularly in, in the German lands, having a knife and a pricker attached to a larger weapon was just a very, very normal thing. And they went to quite extremes with their hunting truces and things like that, where you'd have 10 different items, for instance, all contained with a larger knife. Uh, oh, let's jump around. Another German piece. Goodness, it's all German. One of the reasons there's a lot of German stuff here is I love it. And going back right to the beginning is they were so good at their metalwork. It just comes through pretty. And a lot of the English stuff that's been made at the time is just a little bit boring and a little bit plain and a lot more use of wood and, and brass or uh, bronze. Just not so interesting. So this is a classic Landschneck knife with the S-guard uh, on it there. Absolute classic, taken from a piece in the Royal Armouries uh, in Leeds. But again, you'll find these all over Europe. It, it's just such a common form. And this fishtail shape coming at the top here, it just screams Landschnecht, basically. And sorry for that matter, I think I've been saying Landschnecht and I think it's Landsknecht. So sorry for my pronunciation. And I think Landschnecht for reference means land snail, not land knight. Then we'll go down here. So 14th century Quillen dagger. Now, wheel pommel, downturn, bow tie guard, very kind of normal for the 14th century. Quill and daggers start to become really quite difficult to find in the archaeological record when you go back before about 1400. And they become a lot more corroded, a lot more fragmentary, so you have to look at the manuscript evidence a lot more. But you can see that they're certainly carrying knives very much of this form, which is effectively much like a, a small sword in form. Now, this is... A bollock dagger, lovely little bollock dagger, brass cap on it, single-edged blade, small. A lot of these knives have been big, right? Now, big is intimidating, big is scary, and size goes in fashion as well. So a rondel in one part of history might be small, a rondel in another part of history big. It's the same actually with bollock daggers. So bollock daggers started really as working class weapons. Single-edged. Single-edged so you can work with them. You can put your thumb on the back, you can act precisely, right? If you have a double-sided blade, it really is pretty much only good for stabbing, not much else. Put a blunt back on it and you can suddenly start to work with the thing. And that's what bollock daggers started life as. And they became, well, more high status as life went on. You end up with a guard here because they come a bit more for fighting. Quite early on, especially in Scandinavia, they had a, a pommel cap, but again, not always. Nice small example, this. So really the sort of thing which is suited to sticking through the belt loops of a, a pouch or just hanging on your belt. And actually, while we're on the subject with hanging on the belt, there are films that I've done about how to wear swords and daggers. 
go check them out because they just show all the different ways that you're able to wear these things. Most of these have thongs on and you can tie them on the belt in different ways. It shows those. But in essence, just tying it onto your belt like that and leaving it loose to hang is what they did most of the time. It seems crazy. It seems counterintuitive. Look at the pictures. It's what they did. This is a great example to follow on from, actually, from that last bollock dagger. So now it's got much longer, double-sided, a guard on it, quite clearly a high-status piece. And it is, even has these little decorative rivets here on the, on the balls. It might look like that's just an affectation, but actually they rivet through to the guard because when you're making this thing, it's actually quite difficult to keep everything in the same orientation for carving. So you can pin the guard to the handle and then you've got to make it look nice so you put the decorative rivets on, but you can pin the lot together and that's what keeps it in one place as you're carving it. But that piece itself, you can see now, is really about show. So this one is, is mid 15th century based on a piece in the Rothenberg collection. That's got an ebony handle. This one's got a spalted boxwood. But really you can see how they develop up. Talking of ebony, we're gonna to touch on another couple of knives now. So this eating set here has got a knife, steel bolsters, very nice, 15th century, with ebony scales on it. Now, clearly that is not a wood that is native to the UK, but of course we have fantastic trading links um, all across Europe, you know, down to the Mediterranean and then down beyond. So ebony in large amounts is not gonna be cheap. It'll never be cheap, but it is used, just like they used walrus ivory or Baltic amber or, well, steel from Afghanistan or lapis lazuli from Afghanistan, Northern India. Ebony from Africa, not a problem at all. Vast quantities, no way. But it was an issue in, I think it was 14th century London, where actually it was illegal to dye wood. You were not allowed to colour wood. And I didn't get, haven't got to the bottom of why that's the case, but I believe, I believe the case is that you can pass one kind of wood off against another. And so by doing that, of course, you're essentially making money. But then if we come back to London and Blackwood, this is a Duro Europa dagger. So this is a uh, third century Roman out from Syria. Uh, not exactly European, not exactly my thing. But the reason I'm showing you this is people send me things from time to time and some lovely person sent me a chunk of wood that had been uh, excavated out of the Thames and it was Roman wharf pilings. And it was oak and it was oak that had been down for 2000 years and is black. And it seemed totally appropriate to use it on this particular knife here. The knife itself is interesting, not just because it's got a Roman oak handle, but this sort of um, cocked hat pommel form is definitely, definitely following uh, or leads on to migration era pommels. And so you can see moving from the Roman towards the migration era what's going on, you know, two or 300 years after this. But the blade itself is definitely Eastern. So this is definitely following the kind of forms, the kind of swoops that you had out there in the Middle East at the time um, and in Palestine and in uh, modern day Israel. Now talking of trade routes, this is an interesting one. So this is an Italian basil art. Now, this capital I form is very typical of ones that you find both in England and in Italy. But this particular one here, it's, it's a small dagger. It's quite high status. It, it's the sort of thing that you see a lot on the effigies, 14th, 15th century effigies and artwork all across Italy. Military and civilian weapon, this. In the UK, on nightly effigies, you'll very often see rondels. That's probably the most common. And occasionally you'll see bollock daggers. In Italy, one of the most common will be the Basilard that you'll see. So definitely more common there. But there is this link between Italy and, and England that I've not fully understood, perhaps because of all the mercenary companies that went from England to Italy and then back. But there is a link with this dagger form between England and Italy, and not so much with France in between. But it's uh, forged in a very particular way. So you have a wider piece of steel, you slit down here, slit across there and the arms you fold out uh, and then you beat them down, taper them down and bring them out to this form here. So it looks like a crazy way to make a dagger. Actually, it's not as inefficient as it looks. Again, this is an interesting one. So that's an Italian dagger, would not be out of place in England. But this one is a German Swiss style basil art. And again, it wouldn't be out of place in the UK. This one has got a sort of a caged decoration to the sheath. Again, not that common, but you know, they're, they're around. It's an interesting feature and so I like to make it. Blade itself slightly flares out at the top there. Very stout, very robust. Fits your hand well. Not English. 
but you say not English, but the trade routes between London, going up through Frisia, up towards the Baltic states, Scandinavia and so on, very strong. Coming down from there towards the Mediterranean, down through the Bay of Biscay, down the side of um, Portugal and Spain, very, very strong trade routes. Over into Italy, you know, buying in armour and arms, coming that way from Germany, arms and arms. People in the Middle Ages travelled, they moved about, but they could buy goods from all over. Might cost them a lot, but they could buy goods from all over. And one of the favourite things that was ever sent to me was a picture from a stone carver who was restoring York uh, Minster. And he was up there, ten floors off the ground, and he saw a gargoyle and he took a photo of it. And I think the gargoyle was late 14th century, I think, from memory, a long time ago now. But the gargoyle, presumably following the, uh, the carver who carved it, was wearing a dagger, just like that, which I just think is brilliant. So either he bought it or he was actually a craftsman from that area. Who knows? Next up is this rondel dagger. Interesting thing, this. English, mid-14th century, copied from a... Well, based on a private find. It's not really a copy, but it's based on a private find. Hexagonal boxwood grip. Uh, boxwood itself, actually, incredibly common material for handles because you can carve it. It takes carving fantastically well, detailed. It's tough, it's hard, it's resilient. Brilliant, brilliant handle wood. And it's not that useful for other things because it doesn't come in big billets. You know, you can't get big chunks of boxwood. So it's absolutely perfectly suited to handle. So I use it a lot, they used it a lot. But that's a rondel dagger, but it's not traditionally like the rondel dagger that you might imagine it to be, with a disc top and bottom. Because this is where the story began. And they started with the front guard for whatever reason they started with the front guard. And then, maybe over 30, 40 years, they realised that if they had a big round disc at the back, it presumably added fantastic security for your fist. But to begin with, they were much more normal dagger pommels like this one. Again, as with all my pieces, I try to get things right. So that looks like a big solid chunk of bronze. It's not. It's hollow. Because otherwise everything would just be badly weighted, unstable. It's just, it's just not right. So wherever you see big chunks of metal on a dagger, very often, they're not quite what they seem they are. But talking of big chunks of metal, ridiculous one here, Castillon Dagger. Castillon was one of the last battles of the Hundred Years' War between England and France. It was a devastating defeat in the end for the English armies and driven off in rout and presumably lots of materials were lost and cast away during that. One of those, by the French or the English, of course we don't know, was a dagger like this. Now what is notable about it, it's long, it's big. You know, I get that. It's thick. 14 mil thick at the spine here. So actually the blade is as wide as the guard is. It's a ridiculous thing. And it is very, very much not about cutting. It is about stabbing. It's, it is, in honesty, with a blade like that, it's, it's about bludgeoning. That is as much mace as it is knife. But it's an interesting piece. Unusual because, of course, quill and daggers generally are much smaller. Like this one here. But this predates it quite a lot. But this is a 14th century one. Oh, sorry, 13th century, right at the end of the 13th century. But again, what is notable with a lot of my daggers is the grips, you might think, are small. So look at this, you know, the, my little finger there is coming up onto the pommel. But that's actually normal. If you go look at museum examples, great big grips where there's plenty of room for your hand, they're just not there. It's not what they used. Occasionally you see it on rondels, where it's specifically made, obviously, for a big gauntlet or a big guy. But generally, they're not. Because what you want is you want your hand to clamp around that and to be tight to it. And it to not move. So when you've got your edge aligned and you're holding it, you now know exactly where that edge is. And the thing is, what you need to remember as well when you are talking about handles is, what is the dagger for? It's not a carpenter's tool. You don't use it for eight hours every day. You don't train with it for 20 hours a week or whatever it is. You use it a little bit every now and again. And when it actually comes to pulling out an anger, I don't know. What? Two minutes a month? Minute a month? So where is comfort relevant to that? It, it's just not. They don't need to be comfortable. But when it sits on your hip and you're down there drinking an ale with your mates, you want to look cool. Daggers so often are not about functionality. They are about appearance. The functionality might be there and that might be secondary but very often how cool does that look on my hip? And that handle is a case in point. It's really skinny here, it swells up where your little finger is if you're holding it that way. Swells up there, it's much easier to hold that way. But it's lumpy and it's bumpy. 
It's not an attractive looking handle to hold, but it doesn't matter because you pull it out, you threaten the guy, you have your fight, whatever it is, 30 seconds later, it's back in the sheath, everybody's moved on. It doesn't matter, comfort is not a thing. Don't think it ever is. I think I've prattled on long enough. So talking of comfort, I'm gonna stop. But if you've enjoyed it, and I hope you have actually, then, you know, subscribe, turn your bell notifications on, visit the websites, toddsworkshop.com, absolutely full of this stuff, absolutely full of it. Swords, crossbows, daggers, eating knives, you know, all manner of things. And if custom pieces are not your thing, then come down to toddcutler.com because there we have got fantastic knives like this antenna dagger and all manner of other historical weaponry made at fantastic prices with fantastic detailing. Anyway, I'll see you again sometime, I hope. Happy summer. <laughs>